Okay, um, I guess we might as well get started. So, um, well, I don't think we need an introduction. Well, off you go. Let's just get straight into it. Okay, cool. So it's been quite a while since the last time I spoke now. So maybe I'll just drop in a little bit of a reminder of the important things uh, from last time. So I actually think that these two screenshots basically summarize the entirety of my talk from last time in quite a neat little succinct way. So let me get these on the screen. Okay, so you need to remember that I introduced two different proof style systems, right? So we had the sequence style um, multiplicative uh, linear logic, and then we also had multiplicative proof nets, uh, or, or, or more rather, we had proof structures, and then there was a translation from uh, sequence style linear logic into proof structures, and the image of which is uh, not full, and that image we're going to define to be the proof nets, right? So what I've got here is the translation from one of the systems to the other. So inside this screenshot, you've got the two systems as well as the translation. So this basically gives you everything. Just want to remind yourself that you've got these axiom rules and then you've got cuts, which of course is uh, <clears throat> the, uh, where the, both, both systems of logic get their means for computation. Both systems are, uh, admit cut admissibility. And then we've got uh, times and par and exchange, which doesn't appear in the image of um, proof nets. So, so, so proof structures don't have any exchange explicitly written out inside them. Uh, I'm getting chat conversations already. Is this? It's a very no, no, that's cool. I just want to make sure I keep an eye on that. Um, <clears throat> okay, cool. So that's good. So. Basically, what I want to do today is I want to talk about, you know, the title of the talk is the sequentialization theorem. Um, and so we have this question, right? We say, we know that a proof net is given by the image of, a, of this translation. But if I just gave you a proof structure, right, and I said yes or no, is this then a proof net, then would there be some simple way of being able to work that out without actually explicitly coming up with a uh, sequence style proof that translates to it? Uh, that's the reason why they call it the sequentialization theorem, right? Because in the logic community, the sequence style uh, calcular, calculi are uh, sequential because it tells you which order to do in which direction, whereas some of that information is suppressed on the side of proof structures. Okay, so we're going to find that there is a positive answer to this. We can, in fact, come up with a way of working out whether a given proof structure is a proof net or not. Uh, but I need to introduce some terminology before I can even give the conditions. So we'll build that up and then I'll state the theorem and then we're going to try and prove the theorem and hopefully we can get that done today. So let me start with a definition. <clears throat> I'm going to follow the definition labeling inside my notes just because that's a lot easier and I'm going to get, the, get it completely wrong if I try to do otherwise. Okay, let pi be a proof structure. Well, that's not what I'm defining. Uh, and denotes well, I want to I want to take the tensor and par links. So I'm introducing some notation that takes all of the links inside the proof structure that aren't the axioms. And as per usual, I'll sometimes drop that subscript if it's clear or if I'm feeling lazy. Okay, cool. And so the first important notion is going to be that of a switching, which is just going to be a choice of either a basically a left element or a right element to each element inside this set of tensor and par links corresponding to pi. And I'll explain the intuition behind this switching in just a moment. But let me get the formal definition down. Uh, and it's simply a function into the two-point set.
Cool. So some authors, <clears throat> Gerard in particular, calls this uh, left and right switching, but then there's other uh, conventions. Sometimes it's answer and question. Sometimes it's first switching, second switching, etc. This is one of those things that people disagree on. Sorry, question. Well, yep. um, so how do you think about the actual mathematical structure of a proof structure? So this is an oriented graph equipped with an ordering on the incoming edges at each vertex, I guess, right? You need to specify, I mean, it can't just be an unoriented graph, otherwise you can't tell which, I mean, there was some information in the links about which was the left and the right yeah. premise, right? Yeah, so that's correct. Um, the way that I presented it was I didn't define proof structures to actually be a graph of any form. I just said that we denote them graphically, but to me it was actually just the raw information of the links. So I said that you have like this big collection of axiom links and tensor links and par links, and then they have to satisfy the following conditions. And then the way that you can represent that is you can draw it graphically, right? That was, that was the way that I did it, so that you have the links inside you look, you look dissatisfied with that. If you want to do it graphically, then... <laughs> do I look dissatisfied? Maybe that's just my natural state. Uh, <laughs> I think that's okay. I did it like that purely to make these definitions easier because you're right, it's more than just the graph. You also need the, uh, you need the notion of the links inside it, right? So you need to formalize that some way. And then I just realized that that is the information of the proof structure. So I just made the proof structure the collection of the links. <clears throat> okay. This link pi is a subset of the proof structure. Okay, <clears throat> and then a switch in of a particular link. Is just the element S of tail. That's just some language that tends to be helpful. <clears throat> okay, cool. So this these, the switching of the proof structure is going to end up giving us instructions for how to follow a trip around the uh, graph. And so we're also going to be looking at sequences, you know, paths inside the graph. So I'm going to come up with a definition for that now. And this is 2.8.2. Yeah, my dissatisfaction was real. I think I don't. I don't think. I don't think I like your definition in your note, but we can discuss it afterwards. So. Okay. I mean, I mean, there's the. Do you want to talk about it now? Or? Well, we can, I suppose. The when you say every occurrence of a formula is distinct as the conditions that these sets of so you have a set of links, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you write down, say, an axiom link involving an occurrence a comma i that same a comma i needs to occur in other links if they're actually linked up to any other connectives, correct? Yeah. So what do you mean by every occurrence of a formula is distinct? I, all I was trying to get at with that is that inside, if you take all of the pairs a comma i that appear in all of your links, Oh, I see what you're saying. They only occur twice if they're supposed to in, yeah, supposed in, to. in the, in the yeah. graph in my head. Yeah. So there's a graph here, which is supposed to have vertices, these integers really, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so you're, you're thinking about it as a graph with a labeling system. So I, I think it's clearer to say it actually as a graph because you somehow have a graph in your head and this, this condition that every occurrence of a formula is distinct. I mean, it doesn't actually make any sense as far as I can tell. It's actually a condition on, I mean, two and three are real conditions. I don't, I don't know what one means. Mm. I mean, what if you, I can think about it after, but surely you can also just say you have a collection of distinct uh, occurrences and then from those you construct your links. Isn't that fine? Hey, Billy, you wanted to say something? Uh, I would wonder, like, if you're actually going to make a graph with the formula occurrences as nodes uh i think it would be difficult to come up with a with the definition for the switching um because i think you would want to define it on like particular subgraphs um and I, like when, when you have this sort of triple of um premise premise conclusion what are the edges between them are they like just two edges between the conclusion and each premise 
And is there one between the two premises? Because sometimes you want to pass between them in the path. So that's unclear to me how you would do it if it was actually just a graph on the nodes. I don't really, sorry, I don't really understand that. But I mean, the data that Will has in his definition, I mean, it is a graph. A graph is just a set of things, integers yeah. say, and a set of pairs which give edges and the order matters. I think, I think it is, I mean, I, I think yeah. he has formulated as a, but there's I mean, it's triples. also oriented. There's, there's triples. There's two premises and a conclusion in some of the links and other links just have two formula premises. Oh, I see. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Let's not hold up the talk though, I guess, but yeah, thanks. I understand that. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I've got more of the same, but let's talk about it afterwards. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to introduce two copies of all of the occurrences of formulas inside to proof structure, right? And these are going to be the up elements and the down elements. So I literally just need two different copies of it because as we're following this trip around, we're going to be on one side of the uh, proof structure. And as we're moving in one direction, that's going to be the up. And as we move in another direction, that's going to be the down. So I'm going to cre create paths out of these pairs. <clears throat> so given... given the switch in S. Okay, so yeah, I've got these pre-trips and then appropriate equivalence classes of which are going to be trips. And it's just a sequence of elements inside the set U of pi and it has to uh, satisfy a whole bunch of constraints. And I've taken the screenshot for this. So let me get that up. Oh my goodness, I'm getting my screenshots confused. This is the problem with this method. Is that, is that big enough? I would say no. Yeah. Hopefully we can see this. Yep. Okay, so let's go through this one by one. Okay, so first off, the sequence has to be a loop, right? And then we're not going to allow any elements from uh, in, all, all the other elements are distinct, right? So the only two elements that are the same on the first and the last one. Um, and then you've got all of these conditions that kind of follow the links around. So there are drawings that go along with this, which are probably much easier to understand than this, but this is just a set of requirements that the sequence has to follow, right? So the way that I think about this is the uh, condition two is saying if you have an axiom link and then you've got the up element and the down element of each, then if I have the up element of this A and it's connected with an axiom link to this not A, then what has to come next is the down element of the corresponding formula along the axiom link. And then same thing here, if I have up against not A, then that has to come across to be this down A over here. <clears throat> okay, and then you've got a whole bunch of different options for the tensor and par ones uh, corresponding to whether your switching is given them either left or right switchings. So let me draw that out. If I had A, B,
So I'm going to change for these. Okay, so I'll draw the left switchings on the left and the right switchings on the right. Okay, left tensor looks like this. It's the kind of oblique one. <clears throat> right one is like this. And then with par, you either come in from the left or you come in from the right. So left looks like that. And right looks like that. Okay, cool. Uh, is it is it clear what these mean? So if I were to take this, this is looking like the sequence A par B up, and then what has to come next is A up, and then who knows what comes next, but eventually we'll get down to B down, and then what has to come next is up B, et cetera, right? Okay. Does anyone have any questions about this part? This is pretty important. We're going to be quantifying over all possible switch-ins, and these pre-trips are going to be used all the way throughout the proof of the sequentialization theorem. So if anyone has any questions about these, now is the time to ask. What mnemonic do you use to remember which is left and which is right switching? Yeah. Yeah, I don't really have one. I've just experienced. So with our part, it's very easy. So this one's left because you connect the bottom one to the left and this one's right because you connect the bottom one to the right. Um, you know, you can be rude about it and you can say that right is more canonical than left and then you can say that right. <laughs> uh, it's like this game theoretic interpretation, right? If I want to prove A tensor B, I need to go up and prove A, and I need to go up and prove B at some point. And there are two orders in which I can do that, and right's the canonical way and left's the oblique way. It's, it's a rude way of putting it. <laughs> Sorry to all the lefties out there. Rude, um, rude mnemonics can still work, so. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions about this? <clears throat> um, I noticed you never had a like condition on uh, formula occurrences that aren't premises of anything and is uh, which in that situation I believe if you go down on one of those like conclusion things then you just immediately go up on the same thing yeah it's that's a, that's, a, that's a really good point that's absent in my definition so yeah I need that let's put that but in I'm wondering if that would just be a theorem it's like given <laughs> all these conditions if we assume that yeah like you've got a long trip that satisfies these conditions. I want but how would you define long trip at that point? Uh, as in just a, a no, I don't I don't think it's a theorem. I don't think it's a theorem. How if these if I if this was part of a proof, right? And then that was a conclusion and that was a conclusion, then what would stop me from going here to here and then here to here? Right. And I, I guess you could probably just say yeah, I, I think I need the permission that you need, right? Um, and here I have the same criticism as with calling it a conclusion. So a conclusion of the proof, that's fine, right? Oh, well, you just haven't defined what that is. Sure. I think I spoke about that last time. So you've got what Billy's saying is that there's conclusions of links and there's conclusions of proofs. So if we were to say conclusion of a link, then this would be incorrect. But if it's a conclusion of pi, so we have this condition that every uh, formula is a premise of at most one link, right? Which means it might be a premise of zero links, in which case it's a conclusion for the proof structure. And if we have something like that uh, and X 
j is up a, uh, wait, down a, is a down, then x j plus one equals up a. Cool. So what Billy is saying there is that we need to be able to turn around at the bottom. So this could have anything connected to it. And this is the up element, this is the down element, and then we need to connect that. Cool. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Let's keep going. <clears throat> So yeah, now that I've told you what a pre-trip is, let me tell you what a trip is. So just let this denote all of the pre-trips. And then we say so it's just if I can translate one into the other. I want to have cyclic invariance here. Cool. And then, and then obviously this xi equals y i plus k is taken mod n. <clears throat> but, I, but I think it's clear what's going on here. Okay, cool. And so now I can tell you the actual important condition that is going to be put on a proof structure in order to distinguish whether it's a proof net or not, um, or at least I can introduce the language for it. So, so when we do this, so think about it, we've got this proof structure sitting here, right? And then we're going to construct all of the different pre-trips that can be made inside it, right? Now, and then, and then we take the equivalence classes of which one of two things could happen. Either it turned out that there was only one trip of the entire proof structure. What that means is that the whole thing is kind of interconnected with itself, right? And then, and then the only other pre trips can be found by cycling that. Or that's not the case, which means that there are different pre trips inside it uh, that, that don't meet up. They're, they're kind of these disconnected cycles inside the graph. <clears throat> um, in the first case, we say that pi admits a long trip and it satisfies the long trip condition. And in the first case, uh, it doesn't satisfy that. And so it admits what are called short trips. <clears throat> and uh, these proofs, these proof structures pi that satisfy the long trip condition, they're gonna be central to the talk today. So let's get that down. Um, Cool. Okay, so maybe maybe it's a good time to just give a quick example of this. So if I were to look at two different proof structures, 
know if I want right now. On my wall. So I'll just copy that. Yeah. Cool. So if I were to, if I were to take a trip around this and say I were to give this the right switch in, just to make it easier, then it's going to go like this. Cool. Okay, and then maybe I can find a color other than green. And then if I if I gave it left, then it's going to be very similar, but it's going to be like this. Cool. And so you can see in both situations, we only ended up with one. There weren't multiple uh, cycles. And so there's, and so this is a proof that satisfies the long trip condition, right? This is a proof structure that satisfies the long trip condition. Um, and the sequentialization theorem is going to say that that means that this is a proof there, right? <clears throat> so a non-example, which is a really helpful one to keep in mind, is the following proof structure. So this is a completely valid proof structure, right? And we can believe that this is not coming from a sequence calculus style proof, because what could it possibly be? It would be A, not A, and then I'd have to perform a cut against this, right? And that's not allowable. It's not the way that it works. But this doesn't, uh, it doesn't offend anything in the world of proof structures. That's a perfectly valid proof structure. And then if I were to look at uh, the, the trips around this proof structure, then I've got one here, which just goes around the outside of it but I haven't visited the down element of this guy and I haven't visited the, sorry, uh, yeah, the down element of this guy and the up element of this guy. So there's actually another one which goes on the inside like that. And so you can see that this is a proof structure that emits two different trips um, with respect to the same switching. And so that is a proof structure, which is not a proof net. Does that make sense? Um, so, so the sequentialization theorem is Okay, so that's what the sequentialization theorem says, and so thus the first one is indeed a proof net, and the second one is not. Okay. Do you have a kind of narrative justification for the long trip condition? Like, is there a way of thinking about the logical content of this, or should we put that off for a bit? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I've tried to think of one. The proof eludes me a little bit in that it's very technical, it's very tricky. We do we do something very sly in order to get it to work. So I haven't been able to infer intuition from the proof. Um, yeah, that's something I'd like to have like a more vague discussion about, I think. Do you mind if I push it to the end? Yeah, yeah, let's leave that. I have a quick stab. Yeah, go for it. Um, I guess the the uh, if you look at the tensor links um, and the par links, I, I've, from looking at it, I think they only create um, proof structures with long with the long trip condition. Uh, like for the case of tensor links, only if you connect two separate um, two disjoint proof structures, and in the par link case, it only creates another long trip. Um, condition proof structure if you just par to um, 
occurrences from the same proof structure and essentially the 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 sequence calculus only allows you to um, do those appropriate steps so if you're creating a tensor link um, via a tensor sequence rule it has to be from two separate um, sequence and in the par case just from one yeah but why does that mean that the long trip condition is satisfied right i mean the par one is easy because you have an alignment between what you can do in linear logic and what you can do in uh, proof structures. In linear logic, if I just have two formulas on the right-hand side of the turnstile, I can just par them. And then same thing in proof structures. If I have these two formulas, then I can par them, right? And so you can see where this long trip condition is coming from. It's like, if I've literally just parred two things that are coming from a proof beforehand, then I still have a valid proof. Whereas the tensor one, you need two valid proofs beforehand. And so there has to be some inductive way of comprehending the condition. You're saying that the hard part is suppose the long trip condition is satisfied for a proof, well, for a proof structure that ends in a tensor link. It's difficult to see why that implies that the branches satisfy the long trip condition. Is that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it doesn't the reasoning go the other way around? Well, I mean, that's part of the proof. You could say, I mean, that's only proving that the image of this map, this translation belongs to, to the, those satisfying the long trip condition. It's one way, right? Saying proof nets right. satisfy the long trip condition. The hard part seems like it must be that proving the other way around that if you have the long trip condition for a big proof that it can be deduced for the pieces and therefore you can sort of inductively construct yes. Yeah, the proof. Exactly. And I guess, well, then you can just look at the, like I say just, but <laughs> the tensor link and sort of understand why it ruins the long trip condition if you do it on an already connected proof structure and why it, why the par link ruins the long trip condition if you do it between two disjoint proof structures. Um, mm. I think that would help the other reason. Okay, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, so I'm going to be looking at sub pre trips all throughout this proof. So I want to define some notation for that. Yeah, I'm going to do this new page. Um, well, I think it's likely we'll b blow straight past the twelve o'clock. Uh, time but whatever we're in virtual space so who cares i think you should just keep going until you finish yeah i'd really like to get the the proof out so yeah let's do that okay so pi satisfies the long trip condition Sorry, that, that should be pre trip. Okay, so I'm just looking at the one pre trip that starts at up A, right? And then I'm going to look at the subsequence that just consists of all of those elements uh, in between up A and when A down eventually inevitably comes. And we know that that happens because we satisfy the long trip condition here.
So that's why an XM equals A down. Okay, cool. And then we have a symmetric definition if this up arrow was a down arrow. Cool. Okay, and then, and then I've got these two sets that are similar but different to each other. What I want to do is I want to take all of the occurrences of the formulas that get visited as I go along this pre-trip that I've just defined, right? Uh, that's with respect to a particular switch in S. And then what I also want to be able to take is the intersection of all of those sets ranging over all S. And that's going to be the so-called empire of A. So let me write those down. And I have screenshots of these. Okay, with a symmetric definition in the up empire for the down empire. Okay, cool. <clears throat> and we're gonna be using the empire in order to find a tensor link then splits the proof into two different uh, proof nets from which the original one is constructed, it's the core part of the inductive proof for the uh, difficult part of the sequentialization theorem. Okay, now there's this order to which the um, elements inside the long trip actually uh, will appear, just due to the fact that the proof pi satisfies the long trip condition. Uh, and that's what I want to highlight next. And this is a surprisingly important lemma. This is going to be pushed really, really far. Like I'm even going to be coming back to this when I'm talking about geometry of interaction zero, which is the goal of the next talk. So let's make the following observation. <clears throat> uh, maybe I'll just write the lemma and then prove it. I did it differently in my notes. So LTC is going to be the long trip condition from now on. Sorry, it's a centric again. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you is the order in which these variables A, B, and A tends to be appear inside this long trip.
So this lemma is just telling you the order. We know that we get up A tends to B at some point, we know that we get B down at some point, and if the sweet shield of tau is left, then we know that this occurs before this, and then if we know that the sweet shield is right, it's the other way around. <clears throat> so what is this lemma in Girard that this contradicts? Oh, oh uh, the, the one after this is the one that contradicts it. Oh wait, no, I think this one does contradict it, yeah. Um, Girard, Girard stated that this was the same in both uh, instances, and it's, I could point to it if I had the paper, which I don't have now. I can get a, I can get a reference for it and post it in the chat somewhere. Oh, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the notes. That's what I'm looking at. I'm just, it seems like something sufficiently basic. It's hard to state it falsely, but. Yeah, well, I don't know. We had we had both of these the exact same, but I went through it kind of carefully, and it seems like they they do differ depending on the switch. <clears throat> um. Anyway, let's let's prove this. So we can prove it by contradiction, right? So let's look at the case. is equal to L. Yeah, and say, that's an N. Okay, so it's a really simple lemma, right? All you do is you say, let's assume that it was the other way around. And then you just know that the sequence has to look something like this. And then all you do is you change the switch in, and then you look at what you end up with and you construct a short trip. And then we know that this up B dot 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 down to A down is this part of the uh, sequence here. And so this entire bit has just been missed. And so therefore we don't have a long trip anymore. Okay, and then there's a similar statement for parlinks. It's inside the notes. There's no point in rewriting them now, but I'll give the kind of picture that is very helpful to have inside your head as you're using these lemmas. Uh, so let me just say, so loosely speaking, what we've proven is if I had a tensor length and let's give this the right switch in, then we know that the way that the lawn trip works is it starts here and it comes up to A and then it does something. We don't know what it does, but what we do know now is that it comes back down to this A, right? It doesn't visit the other two. And then this is going to come across to B. It's going to do the same thing. It's going to go somewhere, but it's going to come back to this point B. That's the important part. And then it goes down to A tensor B and it does something else. 
And so that's that's what the tensor links are doing to the trips the entire way. Uh, the picture for the par link is slightly different. Let's let's give this left. And then from here, I go up here. And then we do something, I don't know what, but I know that the next entry point is actually down here at B. And then I know because this is a left switching, it has to come back here. And then it does something, I don't know what, but then it comes down here and then it does something and it comes back like that. All right, cool. Similar picture for the right one and then uh, for par and then similar picture for the left one for tensor. <clears throat> cool. Does that make sense? Let me just get a new page. That was probably. Okay, so we actually have a corollary of this in terms of the language that I introduced earlier, in terms of like the uh, P trip and in terms of empires. So <clears throat> yeah, because we now have a bit of a grip on what these switchings are doing. So let me write that down. Sorry, well, is there a typo in these notes? So when you're defining P trip pi S A up arrow, it should be the subsequence that ends in down arrow A. Is that right? Like it starts in up arrow A and it ends in down arrow A, or is it really meant to be that it ends in up arrow A? Oh, that is a typo. Yeah. yeah that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that would yeah. be a short uh, trip. Right? That's just been typing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would just be M sequence with an N. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's meant to be A down arrow. Okay. Um, did I have that in the talk? <laughs> I don't know. I uh, got called outside when you were explaining that part. So oh, nice. I better run in the talk. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, what am I up to? Yes, I'm up to this corollary. So, a, a formula, let's say occurrence. And then A is one of these arrows. <clears throat> okay, so basically, this is a corollary about the structure of P trip, just taking in mind what we just observed. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different conditions. Uh, it's basically just a list of facts. Uh, let me get a screenshot. Oh, I actually took a screenshot of the statement as well. I didn't realize that. Okay, so I can cover what I just wrote because it's the same as this. I think it's a typo, but in remark 2.0.8, you have something trip pi SA up. That should be P trip, correct? Otherwise, I don't know what it, I don't know what the set trip is. I don't have a remark 2.0.8. Are you on the newest version of the notes? <laughs> I'm on the version that's on the web page. <laughs> right. That's, but yeah. anyway, it, it, I'm correct that it should be, if, if there's something that looks like trip, it should be P trip, correct? Yes. Yeah. There's no, there's no trip <clears throat> if you're talking about a sequence. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, sweet. So this is, this is all kind of obvious, right? So like the important ones in the tensor in the past, let's pay out. Um, pay attention to these. 
um, yeah, we're just saying that if S of tau is L, then as per the previous lemma, we know that the P trip of A down is going to be A down, and then it's going to be the entire P trip of A tends to B, right? It's, it's exactly the drawing that I just had. So after A down, we come here to A tends to B down. And I know that I do this entire thing here. That's the drawing that I just drew. And that squiggly line is P trip A tends to B down. So I'm just replacing that squiggle with P trip. And then you get this lemma. You get this corollary. And it's kind of like fed all the way down. Uh, the important fact, which is a corollary to this corollary, which might make this corollary easier to digest, is the following. So let me write this down and then I'll look at both in, uh, I'll look at both simultaneously. I'll try to keep that on the screen. Okay, so this corollary 2.0.9 is the important one, right? This is the standard type of uh, lemma where it suffices to only check whether one of up C or C down is inside your P trip in order for the other one to be. That's as per this structure. So you're going to find that inductively. Basically, you, you, you induct on the length of P trip A, right? So you can see that A down and up down is both inside it. Um, and so if it's true of these two, then it's going to be true of this entire thing, uh, et cetera. That's kind of a simple inductive argument. And so I didn't want to spell that out here, but it's just an observation on the structure of these, uh, this object P trip. Can you just scroll down so I can see the corollary? Thanks. There you go. Mm -hmm. You have this remark in the notes about the two versions of the tensor link. I'm just wondering what's the, I mean, if, if the other version really is, I mean, so the ver, they're both A tensor B, but A and B appear in different orders in the link. Yeah. If the other order is really just B tensor A, or what's, what's the point of having it? Why not just have B tensor A? I mean, is this, this is like a, a, a kind of subtle form of exchange or something or what? Mm. Well, well, we don't have exchange. The point is to take two premises and then form the tensor of the two. But the tensor is ordered, right? So it's either going to be A tensor B or it's going to be B tensor A, and you have to make any choice as to which one it is. But why? I mean, there's a choice in the notation, but I could make it the unordered set of A and B and B, you know, with some label or something and be done with it. Why? I mean, why insist in the formula on this order, but you get what I'm saying? Like it's kind of what formula? Do you mean why insist on the order of A tensor B? Well, in the formula A tensor B, definitely there's an ordering to it. So A comes before B. Yeah. Uh, but okay, so it's in terms of trips and everything else, uh, it doesn't matter, right? Yes. What order? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's coming from sequence calculus, right? Like sequence calculus insists on an order of 
A tensor B. And so we need to be able to reflect that inside proof structures. I think that's the, that's the only tie I have to that choice. Okay, so yeah, we're going to be trying to prove the sequentialization theorem. And uh, basically there's gonna be a condition which can only be obstructed in one particular uh, unique way. And I need to start setting up the language for that unique obstruction. And it comes down to an analysis of actually particular types of par links that appear inside the proof. <clears throat> I'll explain that more as I go, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a warning for this definition that's coming. Or a little bit of context rather. <clears throat> and then we have the particular type of parlings that we're after. So it's meant to be a par. Okay, cool. So take A and then look at its empire. And then you, uh, the second definition, the link par A naught, is all of the par links that only have one of their premises inside that empire. So it's the par links that touch the empire but aren't, aren't completely inside it. This is going to be a very important type of uh, par link. Okay. Oh, wait, no, this is not so fresh anymore. Yeah, so the realization lemma says that there is actually a particular switch in that's going to realize the empire. Uh, you just need to be careful with the switchings that you give to these particular types of par links, because if they only if they only touch the empire, you need to make sure, you know, if you've got a premise, got two premises A, B, and then it's part of a par link, A par B, then maybe A, the left premise, is the one that's inside the empire and B is not, then you need that par link to be set to a right switching, yeah? because then if you follow the switch around, it's gonna to get to A down, it's gonna just go back to up A rather than going down into the path, yeah? So we need to 
set those carefully, but then the rest can actually be arbitrary and that's going to be a switch and that realizes the empire. I realize as you mean that the, the short trip pre-trip associated starting with the up arrow from that occurrence is the empire. Yeah. So it's that set that I gave earlier, the, the visit, right? right. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Would you be able to give an example of um, a link par zero uh, link? Yeah, I think so. Let's see. I'll just give an example structure to apply this realization now. That's right. Is that it? I think and this is only so if you look at the empire of a tensor. B. For that and for that arrived switching. Wasn't this the one that I gave? You and I had a discussion about this, Billy. Did we agree this one worked? Uh, it looks vaguely familiar, so it probably does work. Yeah. I think that. If I look at the up empire of A, right, then this could be left or this could be right. And if that's left, then yeah, I'm going to go down and touch it. But if it's right, then I won't. And so the intersection of both those switchings is just going to be this one and this one, right? And so therefore, this is a par link, which has only one premise inside the up empire of A. Yeah. That's an example. Cool. Good. Or maybe maybe you were looking at that then. So we define the following function. Okay, cool. So that's not quite a switch in, right? Because I haven't defined a switch in for every single link inside the uh, proof structure, but I can extend it to a uh, switch in in any way. statement. Okay. 
Okay, so let's get the whole thing on the screen. That's the realization lemma. Does the statement make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'm just considering whether to, like what to say about the proof of this. So it's, a, it's an induction on the size of the uh, total links inside A. And it's very much just a case analysis. So you take that corollary that I had earlier that spelt out all of the impacts of the empire, right? And then you just make the observation that if this thing's inside it, then this thing must be inside it, blah, blah, blah. And you infer from the inductive uh, hypothesis in all cases, except for when, so the crucial case is when you have a conclusion and you look at the up empire of this thing, and everything that sits above it is going to be inside that empire because if it's a conclusion of a tensor link, then those two premises are inside the empire. If it's uh, the conclusion of a par link, then those two premises are inside the empire. And so what uh, the only threat is that you go all the way up to the top of the tree and then you hit these axiom links, right? And when you hit the axiom links, the empire starts uh, going downwards now, right? And so as you're going down, one of two things could happen. You're hitting either a tensor link or a par link, right? Or, or nothing, but that's a trivial case. If you hit a tensor link, then you have this fact that if one of the premises are inside the down empire of that premise, then everything else is inside that empire. So as soon as you touch a tensor link, you're going to get everything inside it. And then um, the other case is if I had hit a par link, and in that case, you only get uh, the left premise if the par link is switched to a right switching, and you only get the right premise if the par link is set to a left left switch in. And that's exactly the way that we set up uh, S. So we've, so we've geared it to work. Uh, that's a very hand wavy sketch of the proof. Um, and then filling out the details is kind of going through, maybe, maybe I can do the, maybe I can do one of these cases. So let me go. I'll do, I'll do the case where we actually use the structure of S. Everything else, we don't use its structure at any point. That's the whole reason why you can extend it arbitrarily. Okay, so we're in this situation where we have a par link and the and we're looking at the down empire of not A, right? Then as per the previous corollary, what we have is that uh, Well, that empire, right? Well, actually, we don't even need the previous corollary. It's just obvious. If I'm looking at the down empire of A, then this is either a left switching or it's a right switching. If it's a right switching, then I'm going to go down and grab C part, not A. But if it's a left switching, then I'm not. I'm just going to grab uh, uh, negation of A, right? And so what lies in the intersection of both those things is just the negation of A. So that is just equal to that set, right? And then the crucial point is that that is equal to visit sub S hat of not A down as per the construction of S hat, right? Um, if I had set this to be a right switching, then this visit would indeed have grabbed C par not A and that would have been incorrect. Okay, I think that's all that I want to say about that proof. I'm going to get to the next bit. <clears throat> so just a bit of terminology. I might talk about a terminal link.
right? So the conclusion, the conclusive links of the terminal ones. I'm a bit confused about the terminology here. Is it that it's a conclusion but not a premise or? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is the thing that keeps coming up. Um, there's conclusions of links and there's conclusions of proofs, right? And so inside the proof structure, we had the requirement that every uh, occurrence of a formula is a premise of at most one link, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that it might not be. And in the case where it's not, that's a conclusion. Sorry, and it's just not a premise to anything inside the, inside the proof. Okay, so this is literally just the introduction of a redundant synonym for something, or am I missing something? Well, you could have you could have a non-conclusive tensor link, right? And the formula, the formula might not be the premise to any other link, right? But but I'm saying that the entire link that that formula is part of is terminal. Rather the formula. Right? Okay. All right. Okay, what are we up to? 2.0.16. So, sorry, do you mean it's terminal if it's, if it's conclusion is a conclusion of the proof structure? Yes. Right. So a bit of a technical statement, this one. So pi is going to admit a pi link of a particular form if and only if some condition about the proof holds. So either C is in the up and power of A, D is in the up and power of B, or the other way around, C is in the up and power of B, D is in the up and power of A. And that par link exists if and only if So this thing is a subset, but not the entirety of this visit. Or the same obstruction for the up and power of B. What's the role of the tensor link in this? It's just that if not all your terminal links are pars, you can do this or what? 
I don't understand. Yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely the case that we're interested in. So we're interested in a case where all of your conclusions to the proof are tensor links, right? And then we want to pick out one of them that is such that the empire, the up empire of A union, the up empire of B union, A tensor B is the entire proof, right? And we want to be able to do that. Uh, we'll be able to do that only if this doesn't exist. That's actually what we want to do. So we want to say, say that's not satisfied, then this is not satisfied. That's the direction that we're interested in. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned about this for any switching. I think it's actually for a particular switching. So let me get into the proof and see what it really is. Well, yeah, this makes sense. Okay, so let's just look at the first case, right? <clears throat> then if the switch in S is such that I mean this is a this is a really easy observation, right? So if we're in this case, then if the switching of tau is left, then we just see that the par is not included inside the, M uh, the up empire of B. However, it is included inside the visit. And so therefore we have this uh, non-inclusion. And then the other case is similar. So let me write that down. Um, yeah, then, then C par D. is inside the visit of S less the up empire of B. And then and then similar if the switching of towers, the right switching. Okay, cool. The converse is a bit more interesting. So the core observation in this direction is that there's a, re, there's, there's a rephrasing of the absence of this um, par link, which will then allow us to satisfy the conditions of the previous level that gives us an S that realizes the uh, empires. So if there's no such par link, then what that means is these two sets uh, uh, have empty intersection. Right, because it's not the case that there's a par link with one and one and one and the other. Okay, cool. And then, and then the previous uh, lemma said that we need to gear these two sets in a particular way. Um, you know, we need to switch them in a particular way and then set the rest arbitrarily and then we can realize our empire. And so we can realize both of these empires simultaneously by just getting the switchings correct for these two sets and then we extend them arbitrarily. Thank you. 
minus five and four. Okay, good. So we're, we're actually nearly there now, right? So now what I need to do is introduce the so-called separation letter, which is essentially the justification for the validity of an inductive argument for the sequentialization theorem, right? So let's think about the sequentialization theorem for a second. I want to say that if you are a proof structure that satisfies the long trip condition, then you're a proof net, right? Well, what if you're an axiom, right? Oh, let's assume cut free for simplicity, okay? Then, but, but I can prove it in full generality and I will, but let's consider cut free for now. If I'm a cut free proof structure that satisfies the long trip condition, then I'm just an axiom link, that's all I am. And then that's clearly come from the, uh, that clearly comes from an axiom, uh, uh, deduction rule inside this uh, sequence calculus. So that case is easy. And then what we want to do is we want to kind of induct on the uh, structure of the proof structure that we're looking at. So we look at all of its conclusions and we ask ourselves a question. We say, are one of these conclusions the conclusion of a par link or are none of them such that? Now, if one of them is a conclusion of a par link, then you can actually just remove that par link and then you still have a, a proof structure that satisfies the long-trip condition. And so you get that from the inductive hypothesis very easily. So the difficult case is when there are no conclusions, which are conclusions to par links, right? And so they're all tensor links. Now, the problem that can happen here is that if you just pick one of those tensor links and then you remove that tensor link, you might not actually satisfy the long-trip condition all of a sudden. However, it is the case that there will exist one particular tensor link, uh, at least one particular tensor link, such that if I remove that tensor link, I do end up with, a, uh, with two disjoint proof structures, actually, uh, that, that are both proof nets, and then you can use the inductive hypothesis. So we're trying to tie down this one particular tensor link in that, in that particular case, and what this next one is going to say is that under those conditions, there always exists such a thing. So this is really the main inductive step of the sequentialization theorem. So this is the most important uh, lemma. So in the old version, there's no cut free hypothesis. What's, what did yeah. you figure out there? Yeah, so I, you, you, you jump into my favorite part of the entire thing. So you can, you can go through this entire thing and worry about cuts the entire time, or you can actually assume cut free the entire way and it makes lots of the arguments much easier. And then you can actually prove the cut version as a corollary of the cut free version. And the way that you do that is you say, take your proof structure that has cuts inside it and replace all of those cuts with tensor links, right? Uh, cut and tensor behave in the same way in the sequence calculus. You need to take two, proof, uh, take two proofs and then combine them either as a cut or as a tensor, right? And so if you know that when you replace all of those cuts with tensors, then you can still uh, use the inductive argument, then you can actually do the same thing with the cuts. So what I, what I play is I say, take a proof structure with cuts, replace all of those cuts with tensor links, and then you get a new proof structure. This thing's now cut free. Use the sequentialization theorem on that, and you're going to get a, a new proof uh, with tensor uh, 
uh, deduction rules inside it that map over to the tensor links, take that proof and then replace all of those tensor links with the uh, cut links that you replaced at the start. And then that's going to be a proof that maps over to the uh, proof structure with cuts at the end. But I'm going to describe that again a bit later. <clears throat> but yeah, you infer the cut version from the cut free version. Cool. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah, cool. So you can see why this is called the separation lemma. Uh, just remember from the start of the talk that this is all of the occurrences inside the proof, right? So all of them are just inside this up empire of A, meaning the up empire of B, or your A tensor B itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's actually more to the statement, so more over. Okay, so moreover, uh, removing a tensor B results in a disconnected graph with each component approved structure satisfying the long trip condition. So you can see that I'm trying to uh, appeal to a um, inductive hypothesis here. So yeah, this is going to be used as the inductive step of the sequentialization theorem, as I've already said. Okay, cool. So the way that this is going to work is I'm actually going to define an order on all of these terminal tensor links, right? And then once I've defined that order, I'm going to take the maximal, uh, a, I'm going to take a maximal element of that, and I'm going to assume that this is not satisfied for that particular tensor link, right? And once I assume that's not satisfied, then by the uh, realization lemma, there necessarily exists this par link at some point inside your proof structure. And then from the existence of that par link, I'm going to be able to construct another tensor link, which is actually larger than that supposed maximal element with respect to the, port, uh, the order that I gave at the start, which is going to be a contradiction. So that's going to be the trajectory of the proof. Is it possible to have a terminal tensor link that doesn't have the properties of this one you're talking about in the lemma? Yes. Yes, that's that's kind of the crucial point. Um, if you want an example, there's there's one in um, linear logic. It's like a little like I might be able to reproduce it, but I think I run the risk of getting that wrong. Let's talk about that at the end, and we can point to that example and I can show. But yes, absolutely, that's that's the point. Okay. Okay, we're going to start by looking at the set of tensor links because uh, I'm going to define this partial order on this set. Okay, so so we say sigma
is this or equal to rho? And that's if this union is a subset. So we just inherit it from the set structure on the empires. Easy. Now let's take a maximal such element. So the way I'm supposed to think about this is that, uh, so which way is it? That sigma is above rho in the proof tree if there was a proof tree. Yeah. So your maximal element is actually, well, as makes sense, the lowest. I mean, it's this. It's it wants, the on the tree. Yeah, it wants to be the thing that will be at the bottom of the tree. And you don't. Yes. You don't know at the moment that like these empires are separate disjoint things. Yes. Uh, are these but... all terminal tensor links? Or... No, 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 no. So we're going to define this order on all of the tensor links. And then we're going to take a maximal element. And the first step of the argument is to prove that that thing's terminal. Okay, you misspoke earlier then, because you said take the terminal ones, but yeah. Oh, oh sure. We're taking the order on all of them, but it's not the case that the terminal ones all satisfy this. So it's, it, if I take a maximal element, it's going to be terminal and it's going to be organized amongst the terminal ones as well. So sorry, the misspeaking was because in my head, the important part is the shuffling of the terminal ones, but we do that by considering all of them. Um, okay. Now, assume to the contrary that this equality did not hold. Okay, in this case, we have the existence of a par link. Yeah, but doesn't this terminal thing come in at this point? I mean, if you want to use reach a contradiction with a corollary, you need that tensor link to be terminal, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's, if it wasn't terminal, and we're considering the case where we only have tensor links as our terminal things anyway, then you immediately contradict maximality. Is that what you just said? Are you on mute? Are you on mute, Dan? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought I clicked it, thanks. Um, it's not obvious to me that it contradicts maximality. So suppose I take a maximal tensor thing with respect to your order. Why does it necessarily have to exist? I mean, this isn't a total order, right? So why do I? Why does there have to be a terminal tensor link, which is, which in the union of its empires contains? You see what I'm saying? I mean, contains yeah, so whatever that maximal. I mean, this tensor link, if it's not terminal is sitting above something, right? And all of those somethings are tensor links. That's one of the hypotheses of this lemma is that all of the, all of the conclusions are tensors. And so there is some path from some terminal tensor link up to that one and the empire of the premise in the first step of that path is gonna contain the empire of A and B. And so therefore this one that I've just constructed is more maximal than that previous one. Couldn't your maximal tensor link be above a par link? It's not a conclusion to the proof structure. Yeah, that, that would be fine. And then there could be tensor links underneath it as well. We've got the people going 
of the tree, pa, the premises of pars are inside all of the empires. So the order there would be like there's some tensor link and both its premises. So there's some path from the bottom tensor link up to this tensor link, A tensor B, and it goes through a par link. But that's fine because if it goes up to that par link and then say it goes to the left of that par link, then we know that the empire of A has inside it the empire, oh, sorry, I just said A for this premise. If I have A, oh, <laughs> let's do the exact same mistake again. If I had A prime tensor B prime, and then say, say I was looking at the left branch and that went up somewhere to something par something. And then say I looked at the right branch and that went somewhere. And then we're looking at our uh, maximal tensor link A tensor B, right? Then consider the empire of A prime up, right? That's going to contain the up empire of this par link and that's going to contain the up empire of this and so that's going to contain the up empire of this and so therefore it contains the up empire of both of its premises right so the empire of this contains 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 the empire of this, the empire of this and this and so I've contradicted maximality does that make sense I'll leave my sketches there for me to ponder over. And I'm actually going to use that argument. So I'm going to say that this sigma sits above some tensor link, right? And that's what I'm going to use. So um, yeah, this. Some terminal tensor link. Oh, do I need to be terminal? So I don't need this to be terminal, but to infer the existence of one, I could just consider a terminal tensor link. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna use the realization lemma to get a particular switch in. So, Well, first, actually, what I'm going to do is we've said that sigma sits above rho somewhere, right? So it either sits above E or it sits above F. Without loss in generality, we can just assume that it sits above F. And now I'm going to define the switching. Okay, so I've also assumed that the switching of sigma is equal to L, right? Now, now the point is, in the realization lemma, I said that this thing exists, but it required like the switching such that that holds exists. And the way that you do it is you look at these particular par links and then you set them in a certain way, and then you extend the rest arbitrarily, right? But this par link is not actually one of those examples. So this is one of the ones that gets set arbitrarily inside that lemma. 
Thus, I can actually pick it to be something in particular. And here I'm going to pick it to be uh, a left switch in. And so I know that there exists a switch in such that this holds and this condition is also satisfied. That's actually diving into the proof of that limit a little bit. I have here something slightly stronger than the statement there. Okay, and now we're going to look at a particular um, pre trip and then we're going to fiddle with the switchings and we're going to get a contradiction. That's a bit Okay, so you remember how earlier I was saying that there is this like simple kind of argument that actually dictates the structure of these pre-trips that's going to be surprisingly useful. Yeah, well, that's all that I'm using here, right? So I'm just saying that we have this pre-trip and moreover, we know that it satisfies uh, the following shape, right? Uh, and then there was also this corollary that I had, which said that uh, the up of an element is inside the p-trip, if and only if the down of the element is inside that pre-trip, right? So now the way that the argument goes is we want to we want to ask ourselves where b is, right? So we know that a at the moment is inside. I wish I had more space. I know that's not too small. Okay, so we've already, wait, is this B or D that I want to look at? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we've already, we've, we've, said, we've said that D is an element of the up empire of A and C is an element of the up empire of B, right? Um, Oh, maybe I got that the wrong way around. Sorry, give me one moment. No, 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 no. I'm just getting myself confused. Say what we are in the first case, and the first case is this. Okay, cool. So we have said that C is an element of the up empire of A, and we've said that D is an element of the up empire of B, right? Now, it would be a contradiction if we had the other, if we also had that D was an element of the up empire of A, or we had that C was an element of the up empire of B, then we would have a contradiction because this had to be of a particular shape, right? And so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at this trip and we're going to analyze where B has to appear, right? Now, we know that D is an element of the up empire of B, right? And so we need these two things to kind of be, uh, and it needs to have up B and down B as bookends to this element of the sequence. But I'm not allowed to abuse this. And so I need to put B in a very particular place.
right? That's because of what I said earlier. That's because D is an element of the upper empire of B, right? Okay, cool. And so now we ask ourselves, yeah, okay. Now, now what we say is where is up B, right? We've got these dot, dot, dots. And so it's somewhere, it might be here, it might be here, or it might be here, right? But we need to keep in mind that the up of B is inside the pre-trip if and only if B of down is inside the same pre-trip, right? So if we had that up B was there, it would have to be the case that B down is over here, right? And if we had that up B was here, then it would have to be the case that down B was over here. Okay, so we've actually only got those three possibilities. And the only possibility is that up B is here and B down is here. The reason why is because if up B was to the left of up C par D, then we would know that B down would be to the right of it. And then uh, C par D would be an element of the visit of that trip, which is then inside the empire, which is a contradiction because we know that C is an element of the up empire of A and D is an element of the up empire of B, but they're not both in both. Okay, so the core part of the argument is In fact, we have that up B is an element of this subsequence and B down is an element of this subsequence. <clears throat> I'm trying to think if there's a simple. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and now we ask ourselves what the problem with that is. Well, the problem with that is it now means that B is an element of the visit of F right because we've got b here we've got b here and so if you look at the visit of f then that contains b okay Okay, and so we've managed to prove that B is inside the up empire of F. Now, in my proof, I did this at some point. I took this particular switch in of sigma to be L, right? If I, if I now change that, if I change that to be right, and then I kind of do the same analysis, then I'm actually able to prove that A is an, is an element of the empire of F. And that contradicts maximality. Sorry, my phone which is running internet is not charging. All right, that's better. Cool. Okay, so that proves the first claim. Now what we want to do is we want to say that if we separate those, then we actually get these two distinct uh, proof structures that each satisfy the one-trip condition. And this is a really slick part of the argument. 
Um, let me show you. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead of a sentence. Um, okay, the, the important, so basically the argument is, since we have this, we know that there exists none of those problematic parlings, right? And so the way that we came up with the switch in that realized the empire was by setting the switch in arbitrarily other than those elements of which there are now none, right? So what that means is that an arbitrary switching realizes the empires, and so thus they both must satisfy the long trip condition. So the important part is that this set is empty. And then we're done. <clears throat> so I want to move on to the sequentialization theorem, which is very simple now that we've built up all the pieces. But I think pausing for questions is a good idea. Does anyone want to make a comment or ask a question? It's harder than it seems. <laughs> the I don't know. I mean, the structure doesn't next? seem. The notions don't seem that complicated, but this is fairly intricate, right? I mean, yeah, this is really intricate. It took me. It took me a long time to digest. I can I can explain the sequentialization theorem from like a a, a bit higher up. It's kind of in between, loosely speaking and technically speaking. It's that you have the realization lemma, and then you have the separation lemma. And then you have the sequentialization theorem, right? And the separation lemma is essentially the um, proof that it is sufficient in order to consider an inductive argument for the sequentialization theorem. It gives you merit to be able to. And the way that this separation lemma works is we say, uh, if we take this maximal terminal, if we take this maximal tensor link and it doesn't satisfy the condition that we think it ought, then there's going to exist some par link, which from that we can derive another tensor link, which contradicts maximality of the first one, right? That's the most technical part of the entire story. And it's very, very slick. Mm -mm. But that's all that I'm doing here. I'm saying, we've established the pre-order. I've taken the maximal element, sorry, I've taken the maximal element We've assumed that it doesn't satisfy that condition. And from that, we can infer that there exists a particular par link. And then from that, we can construct another tensor link, which then using an intricate argument, we can show contradicts maximality of the original one. That's the body of the argument. And the rest is deep. The, the rest is filling with switchings and stuff. That's why it's confusing. So the actual sequentialization theorem is straightforward now or is this oh, super easy yeah 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 i mean i'm basically already sketched it but proof of 
Oh, this is the proof of the hard part of the sequentialization theorem, by the way. The fact that proof net satisfies the long trip condition. I'll comment on that later. Okay. So first assume pi is cut free. Okay. So so pi is our proof structure that satisfies the long trip condition. Assume that pi is cut free. Uh, yeah, and then and then we're going to induct on the size of the following set, which is just the number of tensor and par links inside pi. Right, so say there are none of these, then you only consist of axiom links, and that means since you're cut free, you're a single axiom link. Well, I can draw it, I can draw the base case for you. For some A, right? Right, T is our translation function from earlier. So base case is easy. Okay, in the inductive step, there's two cases, an easy one and a hard one. The easy case is if pi admits a conclusion which is a par, right? So like A par B for some A and B. Uh, in this case, all that you need to do is consider pi without that par link and then, and then you just make the observation that it clearly still satisfies the long-term condition, right? So let me just convince you. So if I had A and B and then I did A par B, then the long trip condition, and, and this is terminal, right? So there's nothing after it. I'm getting this weird lag with my iPad. My pen's lagging really badly. I can't tell what's here. Can you guys, can you guys still see this A, B, A par B? Yeah. Yeah, it's not erasing. Correct. I can't get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, if, um, you've, if GoodNotes has been running for a while, it does get a bit like that. Sometimes I have to restart my iPad, unfortunately. Oh God, how annoying! Okay, let me say that. Loud. So, if we have this A par B, then you can remove that A par B. Think about what A par B does. Right, we're looking at the long trip condition. So, for you know, there's two options. It's a left switching or right switching. One's like that. The other one's like that. Whatever. Pick one. Say we're dealing with this case, then. If I remove that par link, right, then all I do is I shorten that pre-trip by one formula, you know? So we've got some sequence and it goes A down followed by A par B down, followed by up A par B, followed by up A, right? If I remove those three elements, I'm still going to get a uh, long trip, right? And so that case follows immediately from the inductive hypothesis. That's super easy. So now we're in the final case, right? And the final case is that we have a cut free Proof structure pi that satisfies the long trip condition and all of its conclusions are conclusions of tensor links, right? Now, by the separation lemma, we know that there exists amongst them one tensor link, which is such that if I remove that tensor link, I get two different proof structures that are still cut free that each satisfy the long trip condition. That's literally what I just proved for you, right? So I get these two proofs, pi one and pi two, that map over to those two disjoint proof structures, and I can just consider the tensor of those two things, and then I've got a new proof that maps over to the original one. Easy. Okay, so now what I have is a sequentialization theorem for all cut-free proofs, right? In order to upgrade that to proofs that might have cut in it, then what I do is I say, let pi be a proof structure, possibly with cuts, that satisfies the long trip condition, 
Okay, replace all of the cut links inside uh, pi by tensor links, and then I get a new proof pi prime, right? Now, by the part of the theorem just proved, there exists some sequence style proof, call it xi, that maps over to pi prime, right? And then with psi, what I do is I go through it and I look at all of the applications of the tensor deduction rule and I just replace them with cuts instead. And then I have to amalgamate the rest of my tree, but whatever, I go ahead and do that. That's going to give me yet a new proof, zeta, and zeta is such that it maps over to pi via t. Simple. Okay, and that's, that's all of it. Cool. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a marathon. Thanks, Will. That was, uh, that was really great. Cool.